for everyone who is joining us today. Uh, my name is Rich Dana, and this is the latest edition of the University of Iowa Special Collections Summer Seminar Series. I'm going to cover basically a whole century of stuff. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, I'll be moving pretty quickly here. So today's presentation is called Cheap Copies, The Rise of Amateur Printing, Fanzines, and the Mimeograph Revolution. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a presentation um, that comes about uh, from my work in a number of different collections uh, within special collections. Um, I was for a time the curatorial assistant to Pete Balistrieri um, for the Hevelin science fiction fanzine uh, collection. And um, so I spent a lot of time with that. And most recently I've worked a lot with the Sackner archives of concrete and visual poetry. And as I was working on these different collections, I started realizing that there were a lot of visual uh, similarities between a lot of stuff that the early 20th century avant-garde was doing and the amateur artists of uh, the fanzine world were doing. So, um, so I've done some, some research on this and uh, these are basically my preliminary findings. Whoops, a little lag in the uh, slide thing here. Um, okay, so poet and provocateur Ed Sanders purchased his first used hand-operated mimeograph machine in 1962. Um, Pre-digital office duplicators like the mimeograph, the ditto machine, and small offset presses freed Sanders and the 1960s radical artists and writers from the constraints of the publishing industry and brought the power of the printing press to the people. Sanders was not the first to use cheap copying technology, however, to produce democratic multiples. Uh, I theorize that Sanders and the radical underground publishers of the 60s took their model from an unlikely source, that being science fiction fandom. Some of them probably grew up among the blue collar teenage fans of far-fetched adventure stories, uh, who had been creating an international network of amateur fanzines since well before the onset of World War II. But from where did these young fans of the fledging genre of science fiction draw their influences? Undoubtedly, they were imitating the cheap printed monthly pulp magazines with titles like Amazing Stories and Weird Tales, but that wasn't their only influence. Another legendary modernist Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud and the father of modern advertising, wrote that people are rarely aware of the real reasons which motivate their actions. In the zeitgeist of this new industrial age were the seeds of political, cultural, and artistic revolt. The wave of immigrants fleeing World War I and the Russian Revolution that brought European artists like Marcel Duchamp to New York also carried the two-year-old child Isaac Asimov from Russia to Ellis Island. So in this presentation, we'll look at the aesthetic oscillation between the highbrow of the avant-garde and these lowbrow outsider artists. Both groups wrote a common sine wave through the 20th century, feralizing the cast off information technology of the era to create the images that defined, um, that defined their, the, their era and that of the future. So um, our story starts more than 60 years before Ed Sanders cranked his first mimeograph copier. In Paris in 1900, the Eiffel Tower was the centerpiece of the World's Fair, standing as a soaring monument to new technology. Coincidentally, the new Edison mimeograph machine also made a big splash at the 1900 World's Fair, cranking out documents with no lead type. Around the same time, Alfred Jarry, the symbolist writer and playwright, was inspiring the fledgling surrealists and Dadaists, but he also wrote and published time travel stories and corresponded with H.G. Wells and other fantasy writers. In many ways, Jarry helped launch both of the parallel movements I'm talking about today. 
Now, I'm not going to go through all the technologies that I'll be talking about, but uh, in the video recording, you'll be able to see all of these. Um, if people have questions about the specifics of the different printing technologies, I'll be happy to address those in more detail in the Q&A session at the end. But for the time being, just uh, to give you an idea what we're talking about, on the left is a hectograph, which is a, a plate with a jelly pad that um, is used to transfer writing. Uh, in the middle is a mimeograph machine, which is a type of stencil duplicator. And on the right is a ditto machine, uh, a spirit duplicator, which basically works on the same theory as that the hectograph. Um, uh, but uh, like I said, I'd be happy to go into that more uh, later. Suffice it to say, they're all um, sort of re revolutionary low cost copying technologies that could produce small numbers of, um, of copies, unlike uh, letterpress, for instance. So the first piece that we'll be looking at today uh, from the University of Iowa Special Collections is the blind man. Um, with the arrival of the wave of European artists escaping the war, New York's fledgling avant-garde was ignited. Marcel Duchamp joined forces with Beatrice Wood and others to produce two issues of the blind man, perhaps the best known of the American Dada publications. This is not in special collections, but I love this piece and I uh, wanted to use it as a reference. And when you see uh, the pieces uh, down the line, I think you'll see why. Uh, Nadezhda Lubavina um, was part of the Zygod Zygod Zygodnia, sorry, the Zygodnia uh, Futurist Art Collective in Russia um, around 1918. Uh, Zygodnia means today. Um, I put this in because unlike the Italian futurists, the work of the Russians was quite crude and, um, and uh, uh, sort of rough. And um, I think it will see that reflected, especially in some of the fanzine artists that we look at down the line. Uh, a much more slick sort of take on things by Louis Lozwick. Uh, this is actually in the Stanley Art Museum. Uh, it's a print. Lozwick immigrated to the United States from the Ukraine to attend design school at Ohio State. Known for his skill as both a painter and lithographer, he created stylized urban images influenced by deco and constructivism. Uh, this piece uh, was done in 1925. And now for the pulps. Frank R. Paul, this is a cover of Amazing Stories depicting H.T. Wells' War of the Worlds. And Frank R. Paul was known as the king of pulp magazine cover art. He was born in Austria and trained as an architect. Paul's work was known for its highly technical detail, uh, but also his almost com comical ineptitude at drawing human faces. The cheap three color printing technique used by pulp, pulp publishers lent that covers their trademark almost stencil-like appearance, those big blocks of color um, and the limited use of color, the limited number of colors used in, in great uh, amounts is uh, definitely indicative of the pulps. Here are a couple of interior illustrations by Frank R. Paul. The one on the right, um, sort of like the Lozwick piece, uh, uh, cityscape of the future with soaring buildings, but the one that really um, uh, uh, kind of appeals to me is the one on the left called Inside a Piece of Sugar, which for 1921 is an extremely psychedelic uh, kind of piece. So the young fans of these science fiction magazines started to uh, experiment with making their own and this fanzine cover was created by a 17-year-old fan from Philadelphia named John Baltadonis, who um, uh, created the first um, fanzine in Philadelphia. Uh, after he served in World, World War II, Baltadonis taught high school art and continued to participate in fandom until his death in 1998. 
and this is a hectograph print. Um, the limited number of colors, um, sort of like the pulp magazines that they were aping, uh, is due to the fact that there were a certain number of aniline dye pencils that would uh, copy through the, the hecto process. They were purple, blue, yellow, red, and sometimes you see some green. Um, and they were not particularly light fast. So a lot of these covers have faded a lot, but this one um, from the Hevelin science fiction collection is in particularly good condition. This is the back cover of a fanzine from 1939 by Leslie Perry, whose real name was Doris Baumgart. Um, she was from Queens. She was a member of the early science fiction club, the Futurians. Um, and she went on to a career as a writer and illustrator of pulp magazines. Unfortunately, died very young of lung cancer. Um, famous as both an outspoken woman in fandom and as an outspoken socialist, uh, this fanzine called In Your Teeth, Gentlemen, is uh, a response to the technocrats in fandom, those who sort of aligned themselves with Italian futurism and sometimes even fascism. To, in, in their defense, many of these technocrats did go on to um, fight the fascists in World War II, uh, but, um, but before, before the war, they were sort of fascinated by the uh, technological marvels of the Italian fascists. Um, another Futurian, John Michel, uh, this is one of his fanzines. Michelle was one of the founders of the New York science fiction group, the Futurians as well. Um, he was considered the most left wing of the Futurians and his particular brand of utopian ideology became known as Michelleism. He would later become su a successful writer and editor, but he also produced the cover art for his early fanzines and his style uh, more so than a lot of others um, really echoed that sort of European avant-garde style. Um, you can see sort of the, the um, Dada slash uh, futurist influence going on here. Damon Knight's work was considerably different. Um, it was very technical and clean. And um, some of you probably won't be surprised to hear that Damon Knight received um, his graphic arts training at a WPA art center in Oregon. Um, he met the members of the Futurians at a science fiction convention in Denver in 1940 and later moved to New York to join the group. Uh, this is a silkscreen print, um, much like many of the WA, WPA posters that we're all familiar with. This is a, a stenciled cover by Jack Weidenbeck uh, it's the cover of Chanticleer magazine from 1945. Um, it's often listed as silkscreen, but I think it's a stencil and airbrush or maybe some sort of uh, pochoir technique. Um, he was from Battle Creek, Michigan and was a member of Nova Press and they were famous for their stencil work. Uh, he and um, Abby and Al Ashby uh, all produce these amazing stenciled covers that um, really have a f the feel of um, of a Russian futurist or constructivist kind of thing. Um, in his book, A Little History of the Mimeograph Revolution, authors Clay and Phillips point to 1943 as the official beginning of the literary movement that became known as the Mimeograph Revolution. Um, when William Everson published poems in an unofficial newsletter, The Untied, and helped run the mimeograph machine and produce his own X-War elegies, among other small volumes, in a conscientious objector camp at Waldport, Oregon. After the war, Everson and other radicals settled in the Bay Area of California, while on the East Coast, Greenwich Village in New York City became the hub of artistic activity. City Lights Books opened in 53, publishing Allen Ginsberg's Howl shortly thereafter. The 40s and 50s were also the heyday of science fiction fanzines, obviously. 
And many fans returned from the military um, and pursued careers as writers and artists or attended college on the GI Bill where they intermingled with the literary and artistic rebels of the time. Science fiction became more experimental and fanzines followed suit. And uh, the, these pictures are not um, of the copies we have in special collections. Some of these uh, I forgot to mention earlier are pictures that I borrowed from elsewhere, but of, of works that are in our collection. So uh, those you'll see um, have a photo credit on the slide indicating where they're from. But we do have in special collections um, uh, copies of the War Elegies by Everson. This is the cover of C Comics and was done by Joe Brainerd, a New York artist influenced by pop, the pop art movement. Um, Brainerd was one of the first to combine poetry and comics. Back to Ed Sanders, his most famous uh, mimeograph was Fuck You, a magazine of the arts. Uh, perhaps no publication of the era illustrates the transgressive nature of the 1960s counterculture so clearly as Fuck You. Uh, Ed Sanders became well known as a member of the proto-punk band The Fugs. Um, while working with Pete Balistrieri, uh, on some uh, some stuff in some flat files in the Ken Friedman Fluxus collection, we came across not one, but multiple copies of this poster. Um, Stan, uh, poster by Stanley Mouse for the Human Bee Inn, which was arguably the first major event of the psychedelic era. This poster by Mouse is a classic hippie mashup of deco and science fiction styles and even the purple color um, is uh, sort of echoes that um, hectograph style. Um, uh, but uh, this was the first of many, um, what would be kind of become the iconic um, psychedelic posters of the 1960s. Also during the 60s, the diggers uh, were doing their thing in the Bay Area and um, they were a radical street theater group uh, that also um, had uh, food distribution systems and other things like that. Um, again, this is from the, the Flexus collection and the 1% free poster, uh, this appeared in the winter of 68 and became a digger trademark for their uh, street events. According to the diggers online archives, various interpretations of the poster's cryptic symbology evolved. Uh, one interpretation which gained a certain popularity was that merchants and rock bands were expected to contribute 1% of their receipts to the Free City Bank to fund various activities, including the food distribution system. Um, Fluxus uh, began happening in the 70s. This is a poster for a performance by the Coombe Transmissions. Uh, they explored graphical propaganda techniques and later became the Art Noise Band Throbbing Gristle uh, and after that Psychic TV. And they um, really started to bridge the gap between Fluxus and Punk. And of course the 70s, 80s and 90s were full of punk fanzines. Um, uh, later developing into what we now call zines. Um, Special Collections holds a great many collections of, of zines and fanzines, including a lot of Riot Girl stuff from the 90s. Um, so uh, if you are interested in taking a deep dive into zines, uh, we have uh, great resources for you, for you to look at. This piece is by Jenny Holzer. Uh, Holzer explores words as visual art and her rubber stamp set challenges the viewer to become a participant in the creation of the art. Um, this is from the recently acquired Sackner Archive of Concrete and Visual Poetry, uh, the, the largest collection of concrete and visual poetry in the world. And its home is now at the University of Iowa. Also from the Sackner collection, this is John Giorno's You Gotta Burn to Shine, a limited edition, uh, which includes spray paint and stencils. 
with lines from his book. And like Holzer, he's pulling the reader deeper into the meaning of the text through participation. And sort of circling back, uh, we'll do a couple of uh, items from the 21st century to wrap up. Uh, Raymond Pettibone and Kristen Sheehan Sullivan, uh, Scream at the Librarian is a soap screen and letterpress book uh, that really has a lot of, this cover shows a lot of, of uh, Dada influence, a lot of Russian influence as well, um, while also being, um, you know, very much in the punk tradition. And finally, we'll uh, wrap up with Shepard Fairey, uh, Shepard's uh, uh, post-punk graphic artist who created uh, the Russian constructivist inspired progress posters and stickers to express his support for the presidential campaign of Barack Obama. They were so popular that the Obama campaign contacted Ferry and asked him to produce another edition, but asked if he would change the slogan to the now famous hope And uh, I will wrap up with a quote from Michael Basinki uh, in, from his introduction to an author index to little magazines of the mimeograph revolution. And he's talking specifically about the literary movement here, but I think uh, everything he says here applies to um, fanzines as well. The mimeograph revolution did not instantly precipitate. Through the 1950s, there were little magazines publishing innovative poetry. They existed in the shadow of Eisenhower and McCarthyism. The university system was expanding and was both inspirational and an easy target for those crazy, craving a frank poetic engagement. It was a heady time. Their publishing was meant to be rebellious and therefore a romantic aura surrounded the Mimeo revolution. Its legitimate parameters have yet to be fully established. Its full impact has yet to be considered. The context, materiality, and the history of the Mimeo revolution await documentation. The stories of the editors, poets, and their Mimeo magazines needs to be written. And with that, I will say thank you uh, for coming and watching and uh, we'll stop the recording and we will uh, make time for some questions.